So the next story, uh, a woman uh, recently went to a retreat at the Insight Meditation Society and was doing, was meeting with Joseph Goldstein, one of the teachers there. And at this retreat, um, she was feeling a very familiar set of emotions, of feeling very lonely and feeling a yearning for for more connection and a lot of feeling of hurt and, and pain. And with that, the sense, I need love. Love is missing from my life. I need love. So she could see how many of the emotions and feelings and thoughts all came down to, I need love. She'd gotten to that. So she goes into an interview with Joseph, and I'll just step take a step back for a moment and say, Joseph is one of my very first teachers in this tradition, and he's wonderful, very, very clear, and if you have the occasion to listen to his talks or read any of his books, you'll find him an inspiration, as he was for this woman. So she goes into the interview and she says, you know, I've really gotten down to the core, and it's a sense that I need love. And she, and her, and she said, and here's my question. If I can't offer it to myself, how do I find it? Okay, that was her question. So, to her surprise, he, his response was, well, bring your awareness to that need for love and just look at it as another story. Initially, she was uh, real aversive to that idea. <laughs> You know, she, she said, you know, how could the need for love be just a story? You know, I'm a human being and I need love, you know. And, and so isn't, you know, isn't that what we all need? And, you know, so she was, she was resistant. So he calmly responded, and this is what he said. You don't have to sign a contract. Just try to look at it as a story. And if you feel it doesn't work, then come back to believing you're someone in need of love. <laughs> That's vintage Joseph, by the way. <laughs> you don't have to sign a contract. So um, she went out and began doing walking meditation and so on. And when she'd have, um, you know, any thoughts or feelings that had to do with that same constellation, she would just challenge. She'd say, who, need, who, who says I need love? I mean, this is a story. And she said that as she began to do that, not just be, have that story be the truth, but just say, okay, here's a story, it's just a story. She, they made room for her heart to open up and she started feeling the most open-hearted she had felt in a very, very long time. She said, I, I could feel my heart in its fullest expression. Holding on to that belief, I need love, was closing my heart to myself. Once I let go of believing it, I was empowered. My heart was just already there, full with love. This is real, but not true. The belief that I don't have enough love in my life, that something's missing, that something's wrong, is a very real and often very deep, and as we'll talk about, very tenacious feeling. We need to respect it by saying, yes, it's real, and offering it real attention. And we don't have to believe it there can be that kind of crack that starts opening up space and says, and it's a story. And by opening up just that space that, it's as Joseph said, just that willingness not to sign a contract, but just to say, well, this is a story. There's something that's more true that has room to shine through. It's not being obscured by this real dense belief. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is the first step, what am I believing? And to look through the eyes of that suffering place. The second step is really on some level to say, is this true? Now here, this is a question that uh, Byron Katie, uh, if you haven't read Byron Katie's book, she is uh, one of the uh, real pioneers and a really wonderful teacher in being able to wake up out of limiting beliefs. So I recommend her very, very highly. So this question, is this true? Okay. Now maybe you'll ask that question, you know, is it true that I'm a worthless failure? Yeah, it's true, you know. But 
even if you affirm it, just by asking the question, you're still opening up the space of a question, of an inquiry, which is larger than the pure assumption. It opens up some space just to ask. It makes room. For many of us, we'll ask that question and we'll say, well, it seems so, but there's some sense of, probably, but maybe not, you know, something like that. Asking the question is really important. The next step, though, to me is at the heart of it, which is, what is it like to live with this belief? And what does it do to our body and our heart if we're always saying to ourselves, I need love, or I'm not lovable, or I'm flawed? What does it do to us? I mean, what if we really examined what happens in our body, in our heart and in our mind, when in the background we're buying into a belief like that? I'll tell you my own story of, because I've done many rounds of, you know, saying, okay, what am I believing now? And, and saying, is it true? And one, of, and one of these rounds, and this was way, way back, early days of meditation, I was attending teachings with a, a very popular teacher. And we'd go, I went to a number of events, day longs and weekends and so on. And after about a half a year, three quarters of a year, because I was kind of doing it intensively, I came to this conclusion that he didn't like me. And it was a really painful conclusion because I would go with different friends, different people from the, you know, from the spiritual community, and he would joke around with my friends. And I would say something and he almost wouldn't, it would be like I wasn't there. He was ignoring me. And um, he seemed, either he would have a disapproving look or he was ignoring me. Now, so, is it true? Seems so, <laughs> you know, it really felt like it was. But, you know, who knows? But then I asked the question, well, how does it feel to believe that he doesn't like me? And it put me right into a, a very familiar young place of really needing somebody in particular to approve of me and feeling very caught in feeling insecure and unappealing and feeling uptight and just the neediness itself feeling ashamed of. So it's a mix of wanting something and being ashamed of wanting. Really unpleasant, very young feeling. So, so asking that question, what's it like to live with this? I realize, oh, this is putting my body-mind into, into a suffering place, you know? Then the inquiry, well, what stops us from letting go? I mean, why do we hold on? What, what has us hold on to beliefs about ourselves that are clearly keeping us at war with ourselves and separate from others, that are limiting our capacity to find joy? You know, how can we hold so tight? And what I find for myself is almost like, well, I'm not going to be made a fool of I'm going to know that this is going on. You know, I'm nobody's fool. You know, I'd rather know it even if it's unpleasant and have some certainty than I get caught off guard. Does that resonate for some of you? We, we want certainty and we will believe things that are really, really unpleasant if it gives us some orientation because then we feel at least we can get a modicum of control. We can do something if we know rather than just say, well, I don't know, maybe he does or maybe he doesn't, you know? So we hold on tight because it gives us the illusion of control. There's a classic Zen story and many of them start this way of, you know, a man being chased by a tiger, falls off the edge of a, you know, ends up falling from a precipice, finds himself hanging perilously from a limb and the tiger's pacing above and there's jagged rocks, you know, way, way below, calls out, help, is anyone there? And there's an answer, yes, booming from the heavens. God? (laughs) Yes. God, can you help me? Yes, you need to do only one thing, says the great booming voice. I'll do anything. Then just let go. Is anyone else there? (laughs) So 
silly, I know, but <clears throat> you, get the, you get the gist that it's like we'll do almost anything than just say, well, what would happen? I'm not signing a contract, so what would happen if just for a while I said, okay, this is just a story? What makes us willing to say this is just a story, even for a while? And what I found is what makes us willing to challenge, to say this is real but not necessarily true, is that when we get the suffering of living with the belief, and when we really get this is keeping my life small, this is stopping me from having intimacy with others, this is like st stamping down any creativity, this is, I'm, I'll be at the end of my life looking back and I'll have lived my life inside this prison. When we get that suffering, there's some willingness, we can't will it, but there's some willingness to say, okay, the belief is real, but it's not true or it might not be true. That's all we need, a little space. So, for me, in, in that situation, just to kind of finish it off, um, there's another question that we can ask that I want to share with you. Once we've said, you know, what's it like to live with this belief, and I really got, oh my God, really, really small, then we ask the question, what would life be like if I wasn't believing this? And we're just, this is where we begin to say, okay, sense the possibility. This is where our destiny can change. What would it be like if I wasn't believing it? Now, if you ask that question before you've really felt what it's like to live with it, it's going to be mental and abstract. You will not get a real response. But if you've opened up your compassion by sensing what it's like to live with that belief, then you can say, well, what would it be like without it? Okay? I'm saying that because it's really important that you don't skip over the step of feeling the suffering of the belief. Okay, so what would it be like without it? And for me, when I tried that on, and I, I remember very distinctly, I was just back from a weekend where I was, you know, really feeling in the grip of, you know, why do I keep sitting with this guy? He doesn't like me, you know, and it makes me feel bad. And I went through this whole process I've described, and when I said, well, what would my life be like if I didn't believe this? And I felt almost like this bubble of laughter in my heart. You know, it's like something, there was something so dramatic and freeing and entertaining. It was almost like a laughter inside. Because I realized I'd be free to appreciate him. I'd be free to just learn the teachings because he had a lot to share. I'd be relaxed. I'd be more spontaneous. I wouldn't be in that needy little girl wanting approval space. I'd just be natural. I'd be freed up, you know. So I'd be able to let the dance unfold itself without that filter that was historic of somebody doesn't approve of me. It was a real experience, but not true. Then I even went deeper, you know, because when, when we say what's true, well, is there really, you know, when I was thinking he is rejecting me, okay, inside that teacher, was there a he, this little personality self judging and rejecting me? Is that who he is? a judge that rejects, he's more than that. I knew that. Doesn't mean he doesn't have judgments, but the who he is, the truth, the wholeness of who he is, more than that. Am I this little person who's a rejectable self? I might have feelings of rejection, they're real, but the truth is I'm bigger than that. So can you see where this inquiry went to? This real but not true took me back to who I really am. This beingness, this awareness, this tenderness that sure has all sorts of conditioned streams of feeling insecure, but that doesn't speak to the wholeness. So this is what the Buddha described as a shift in identity that's possible when we're caught inside a belief if we're willing to examine it. Illusion exists unless it's examined. And this is really very much the um, invitation of 
this path of mindful awareness. Because each one of us has, has places where we get stuck and get caught in a sense of the who I am that's very small. Every one of us, unless we're free, we live many moments of our day inside a wanting self, a fearing self, a worried self, a striving self, you know. I read somewhere that Aristotle described our true nature as our highest potential. That it doesn't mean that this ocean that we are doesn't have all sorts of waves moving through it of different emotions and behaviors. But the who we are is our highest potential, which is loving presence, which is to realize and live from loving presence. So any belief that keeps us from remembering that is a belief to examine. Any moment that we're forgetting our potential, forgetting the who's here, the, the awareness that's looking through your eyes right now and listening, and that tenderness in you that wants to love freely. Any time that you're living in something smaller and a belief that makes you smaller is a moment of suffering because you're not living in reality. And suffering is any moment that we are not living in reality, in our true nature. Doesn't mean we have to be manifesting it. Clearly, our highest potential to live from loving presence, we got caught in different conditioning. But it's possible to remember your oceanness on some level, to remember this presence, and still find yourself caught in all the neurotic daily stuff. There can be a remembering. And when you really get stuck, unpack the belief, open the prison door. This is the way, you know, there's, a, there's a sense that when we're in pain sometimes, that it's, you know, a personal suffering and that it shouldn't be happening. This is a Sufi teaching that I love. It says, overcome any bitterness that may have come because you were not up to the magnitude of the pain that was entrusted to you like the mother of the world who carries the pain of the world in her heart, each one of us is part of her heart and therefore endowed with a certain measure of cosmic pain. So when the pain comes, when the emotional stuckness comes, it's part of our universal conditioning. And yet we have this incredible tool we have this incredible capacity to pause and say, well, what am I believing? We have this capacity to sense, is it true? We have a capacity to sense what our body-mind feels like when we're caught in it. And we have the capacity to sense what our life might be like without it. This is Rumi again, he says, be empty of worrying. Think of who created thought. Why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? Move outside the tangle of fear thinking. Live in silence. Flow down and down in always widening rings of being. So tonight, real but not true this possibility of honoring the, the pain, the emotions, the beliefs as existing, but challenging them. So we'll end in this way where we'll actually practice uh, those steps. And I'd like to invite you each to you know, take a moment to be right here, finding a way of sitting that lets you come into stillness, Closing your eyes. Connecting with your body's aliveness. Come home, come home right now. Connecting with your breath.
And just scanning and sensing uh, where there might be a place in your life, repeating patterns that cause suffering where you end up getting stuck in some sort of a reactivity and that leaves you caught in fear or anger that leaves you caught in perhaps jealousy, insecurity, deficiencies, feelings of deficiency that leaves you in some way at war with yourself or someone else I'm wrong, I'm falling short, this person is and as you sense a situation you might ask yourself, what am I believing? and in this case, really believing about yourself What are you believing about yourself? Is it that you're failing, falling short? Is it that you're unlovable, unworthy, endangered? What are you believing? If you find you're digging and you're not finding something, you're just spinning around, that's quite fine. Just know that that's an inquiry that you can pursue. You, when you're feeling in the midst of being stuck, you can look through the, through the eyes of the fearful place or the angry place and just sense, what's its view of the world? Is it that others don't like me? Is it that I'll never get what I want? Is it that I'm falling short? What's the, what's the view from this place? And then to really ask yourself, is it true? Just check in, is it true? And just see what happens when you ask that. Do you get a dogged, oh sure it is? Or do you get some place and you go, well, I'm not sure, seems so. Now, importantly, sense what it's like to believe this belief. Tell yourself the belief, remind yourself of it, and, and sense what happens in your body when you're really believing this, when you've brought together all the evidence, when your nervous system is really in the mode of believing this belief. What does your body feel like? You might sense even the expression on your face when you're believing the belief and you actually let yourself make it. It'll help you get in touch. What's your heart feel like when you're believing this belief? And what happens in your life when you're believing this belief? What, what, how does it affect your life? How does it affect your relationships with other people? See if you can sense a natural compassion for the realness of the experience. And yet sense the belief as a story and ask yourself, what would my life be like if I wasn't believing this? Just curious, what, what would it be like? And you might sense just a, a shift in your body without anything else, or you might sense something happening with sound or your vision, you might sense an image of something.
just for a few moments, really imagine, okay, it's just a story. What happens? Who would you be without that story? What would your sense of your own being be? just sense your own heart and in your heart's willingness to wake up out of the trance, the beliefs that keep you from inhabiting the truth of who you are, just that willingness to move in that direction as you listen to these closing words from Rumi. He says, I must have been incredibly simple or drunk or insane to sneak into my own house and steal money, to climb over the fence and take my own vegetables, but no more. I've gotten free of that ignorant fist that was pinching and twisting my secret self. The universe and the light of the stars come through me. I am the crescent moon put up over the gate to the festival. <laughs> <laughs>